Hey, good morning, everyone. It's always nice to be uh, at, uh, with you guys here at RCA. I get to see my old friends, uh, Pastor Sabrina, uh, Pastor Peter, uh, all of whom I've known for eons and decades. Uh, they have seen me grown up. They have seen my uh, bad habits. They have seen uh, my mistakes. But I'm glad they are journeying with me in my walk with God. Um, well, before I begin, um, you, know, uh, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we have heard about the conflict in Ukraine. And the Lord has placed upon my heart uh, a big burden. And um, can I ask, can I trouble all, all of us to, uh, to stand as we pray for the Ukraine crisis? Um, you, know, you know, we are so comfortable, isn't that, isn't that true, uh, in Singapore? Um, we have, uh, you know, we, we, we have access to food. Uh, we have access uh, to, to buy clothes. We have uh, access to whatever we need. Uh, you know, nowadays with Shopee and etc. And I want, I want to correct Sister Marilee on one thing. You don't just share on Metaverse. You're supposed to like and share on Metaverse. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll be looking forward to your preaching next week. And, but yet, we, we know of the massive exodus of uh, Ukrainians, especially uh, women and children uh, from Ukraine to the neighboring countries, uh, to Poland, uh, of course, with Moldova and some of the other countries. And my heart is burdened because these are, this are ordinary people just like you and I. Uh, you know, and they have had a roof, roof over their head. They have had life like we know it. But all of a sudden, their lives changed overnight. And as we stand, can we extend our hand uh, to pray for the Ukrainians? Let's pray for peace in the, in the region. Let's pray for the women, the children who have left the country. Pray for the men who are fighting the war. Let's really pray and ask the Lord to come and to bring forth his providence and his peace. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we are so thankful that we are able to be here in Singapore. And that we have so many things to thank you for. The blessings that we have here, the the roof over our head, the, the food that we are just able to to just hit downstairs to buy or even turn on our app and to have food delivered to our doorsteps. We have, we, have, we, have a, we have an occupation, we have a career. But as we remember the Ukrainians, Lord, our hearts goes out to them. And we pray, Father, for your divine peace, your divine protection upon every Ukrainian, especially for the women and the children who have left their home country into another country where they are strangers in that land. And we pray for your protection. That we know that in the borders, there are, there are many things that are happening. Uh, human trafficking. Uh, These women and children are being exploited. And Father, we ask right now for your hands of grace, for your hands of love to protect them. And we pray that the church, the church, in the, the church our present church, Lord, will rise up at a time like this, Lord, to be able to, to be the salt and light and to be a, a blessing to these ones who are suffering. And so, Father, we ask this day, by your grace and by your divine hand, reign your peace, reign your protection over the entire nation of Ukraine. And we ask that, God, that you will intervene in this situation. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for praying together with me. Uh, well, I was just sharing with PSAP that, um, that the Lord has laid upon my heart to maybe even make a trip to, to Poland uh, to see what can be done. So pray along with me, all right? And uh, please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14, and we will be looking at verse 22 all the way uh, to verse uh, 32, okay? Uh, verse 33, rather, all right? Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to verse 36, all right? This account is a very familiar account of Peter walking on water, all right? And I know that probably for many of us, we know this account by heart. You know, we have, we have heard from it. Uh, maybe for some of us who have grown up in church, we have heard from it in our Sunday school. For some of us who have been in church for a long time, you know, we have heard of this passage and we know it by heart. You know, in a recent Bloomberg Investment Conference, um, our senior, mini- our senior, min- our senior uh, minister and chairman of our Monetary Authority of Singapore, Mr. Taman, he gave a speech. And this speech, and in this speech, this is what he said. He said that the world is being challenged by a perfect storm. The world 
is being challenged by a perfect storm. If you help me with the next slide. And he gave five things of what he observes is going to happen in the next 10 years, in that sense. So he says that in the first thing, in this perfect storm, what will it be, this, what will it be described? And how will it be, how, what are some factors that will contribute to this perfect storm? So firstly, he said the Ukraine war represents a rupture in the system of rules that govern global stability. And we know that right now, that war can happen again in our century, in our time. You know, we, the last world war that happened was like many years ago. Uh, well, let's not refer to the, the conflict uh, in, uh, of course, in, in, in Afghan or Syria. But the reality is that it's real. And today, as I was reading the newspaper, um, of course, we don't quote po if those of you who are, <laughs> you know, who are, who are Hokkien's, you don't read physical newspaper. I was reading the, the news and I read that, you know, the possibility of Taiwan being invaded is now a possibility. And so that's the first, first point that, they, that uh, Mr. Tarman gave. The second factor is that the risk of stagflation is very real. Slow, slow economic growth, but in the midst of hyperinflation. Okay, I'm not going to go into the description, but it's a reality that we're going to go into stagflation. And it's going to impact us. Third, the climate crisis looms. Fourth, the pandemic insecurity. Omicron will not be the last variant in this current pandemic, and we know it. And for some of us who are not here, who are listening at home, I understand that some of you have come down with COVID. I am one of them who have come down with COVID. I've recovered by the grace of God. I pray that you will recover well, you will not have long COVID, and that you will recover fully, okay? And the fifth factor that he was talking about was that there will be a divergence in growth and well-being, both within societies and across the world. And so what he's saying is that the rich-poor divide will continue to grow. It will keep growing and keep growing. The rich will become poorer, uh, sorry, the rich will become richer, and the poor will become poorer. And so that is what's happening. The perfect storm is looming in, our, in, in the world system, in the financial system. And interesting, interestingly, just last Tuesday, four days, uh, five days ago, I received an investment report from Standard Charter. And I'd like to, for you to show, and this is what it says, the perfect storm. And of course, this, this uh, article is referring to the perfect storm that is looming in the, in the China equity market. But regardless, not just in the earthly sense, but in the spiritual sense, there is a storm that is looming, or even there's a storm that is already raging in our, in our midst. You know, we are living in really perilous times. You know, in the month of January, we have heard about the threat that Russia wanted to invade Ukraine. But at a point in time in, in January, we thought that, well, this is but a threat. And the base case scenario was that, no, nah, it won't happen. But as of today, we are already 24 days into the war. And unfortunately, we do not see a quick resolution to this war. You know, I've shared just now the millions, millions upon millions, millions of Ukrainians have left the country, going to surrounding countries looking for safe haven. Some of, many of them without money, without food, without lodging, without friends. You know, isn't it good that now we, we are able to sit close, close to each other, right? You know, sit close, you know, and then we're able to bum each other. Of course, we try not to. But that is what's happening in East Europe. And storms are inevitable seasons of life, whether we like it or not. Storms are inevitable. You know, while we can, we, while we can take shelter, you know, from the physical storm, you know, this morning my wife is telling me, you know, there's going to be a storm coming, but it didn't come. But, but we can take shelter from the physical storms of life, but unfortunately, we cannot take storms, we cannot take shelter from the storms that are not physical. Storms that are emotional, relational, financial. We can't. For us as believers, we thank God. We thank God that we can take our refuge in Jesus because the Bible tells us that God is on our side. And second to that, when we begin to see the storms of life from God's angle, we are better, to, we are better able to, to not just survive, but also to thrive in those storms. And my heart and my prayer this morning is that you will be able to see the storms of life from God's angle and not from our angle. 
In Romans chapter 8, verse 37, from the International Standard Version, it says this, In all things, all right, say quietly with me, in all things. In all things, we are triumphantly victorious due to the one who loved us. Due to the one who loved us. You know, this morning, I, I'm, I'm so glad that we sang those worship songs. You know, Jesus is the one who loved us. And because he loved us so much, we are able to be triumphant and victorious. We are meant to thrive and not just to tread. And this morning, I'd like to share with you three points from this narrative of Peter walking on water on how we can thrive in the storms of life. And so firstly, we have to recognize the Lord of the storm. Recognize the Lord of the storm. So in your Bibles, it's shown also on your screens, read together with me, all right? So if you are turning in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to verse 27, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. All right, say with me, to the other side. Okay, this, this will be something important to remember. All right, verse 23. After he had dismissed them, he went on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Verse 25. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Well, the context of this narrative takes place right after another miracle that had happened. And the miracle, if you look at your Bibles in chapter 14, happened after the feeding of the 5,000. All right? So it was a tremendous miracle. And many of us know what happened in the feeding of the 5,000, where just five loaves and two fishes, Jesus multiplied it, handed it to the disciples, and distributed it to the tens of thousands of people that were there. And that was what happened when Jesus told, after, right after that time of powerful ministry, Jesus told his disciples, immediately get on the boat and right now go to the other side. No time to rest, no time to revel, you know, in the celebration of the leftover bread, you know, and, 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 and the fishes, but to go on to the other side. You know, the text doesn't tell us, you know, how long Jesus was praying, but he came to the, to the disciples about 3 a.m. in the morning. And so you, you remember this. The context that the disciples were in was that they were in a boat. And the boat that they were in was not big. It was just a small, you know, small fishing boat. And not only that, they were buffeted by the waves. They were, they were, they, there was a storm. There was a severe storm that was raging at that point in time. And then it was 3 a.m. in the morning that Jesus came to them. And hear the words of Jesus, which I repeated just now. He says this, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. You know, maybe it's for some of the disciples, they would have preferred Jesus to say to them, and to say to the storm, be still, then you tell me, you know, take, uh, before he said, take courage, it is I. Isn't that true for, for most of us as well? You know, you, know, you know, Jesus, why don't we just calm the storm first, you know? You know, you know, take courage, it is I. You know, no bearing, you know, I'm suffering right now. You're telling me who you are? You see, the fact is that, unfortunately, in our English text, we are not able to appreciate the full meaning of what Jesus was saying in, this, in, this, in, in, in his reply, in, in, his, uh, in, in, his, in his statement to them without understanding the original meaning of the Greek text. And so, I would like, so if you can help me uh, with the next slide. You see, when Jesus said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid, between the phrase, between the, the statement, take courage and don't be afraid, sits this three word, English words, all right? It is I. It is, it is I. It's like, it is me. It is I. But, you know, so what? You know, it, I, I, we know you are Jesus. You know, you, you did that. Uh, you know, we know you as, you know, as, 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 uh, as, you know, as, as, as a friend. We know you, that you are able to multiply the, the, the five loaves and two fishes. But who are you? 
But if you go back to the Greek text, there's only two words. Ego, Amy. Ego, Amy. And basically what Ego, Amy is, stands for the word I am. I am. You know, for many of us, it says, mm, I am. It's okay. Again, so what, right? So what? But right now, if we go back to the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 to 14, the next slide, please. Moses asked, uh, the next slide, please. Moses asked God this question. You know, indeed, you know, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and, and, say, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And this is God's reply to Moses. He says, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children, I am has sent me, has sent me to you. And so, if you can meet with the previous slide, and what Jesus was saying in this very text, take courage, it is I, he's saying that I am God. I am God. He's asserting to his disciples that he is God, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament who parted the Red Sea, the God of the Old Testament who led the, 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 the people of Israel out of Egypt into the Promised Land. It was the same God who called himself I Am, who, 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 uh, who, who brought forth miracles after miracles in the Old Testament, who, you know, in the New Testament, we saw that this God who calls himself I Am, delivering the sick, you know, delivering the demon possessed. And this is who God says when he was walking to them on water, saying, take courage. I am the one who is able to do that which is impossible with men. I am. You know, Jesus could have come to them on a much bigger boat. You know, you know we, we have also read that uh, you know, many of the, the yachts that belong to the Russian ol uh, oligarchs have been confiscated. And those are huge yachts. I was thinking that like 1.5 football field. Oh my gosh, that's a huge yacht. You know, Jesus could have very well come in a bigger boat, you know, and then rescue them from the boat. But he did not. Guess what? He came in a grand entrance, walking on water. You know, that very, that very image tells us that he is able to defy the laws of nature. And because if he is able to defy the laws of nature, what is a storm? Think about it. The next slide. Think about it. What is a storm when you have the power to defy the laws of nature? Jesus said to his disciples, I am. And because I am, you do not need to be afraid. You can take courage. Some of us are going through storms in our lives. I don't know what kind of storms, emotional storms, financial storms, maybe a literal storm. Maybe some of you are going, really getting affected by COVID. But Jesus said, I am. As simple as it is, I am. Recognize that I am the Lord of the storm. Recognize that I can defy the laws of nature. And that is why you can thrive in a storm, because I am. You know, my youngest son, Kyler, which is, no, not same age as uh, uh, Pastor Peter's son. Okay. You know, when, uh, 16 years ago, when he was still a little baby, um, I had a call from my wife. Uh, and, and then uh, at a point in time, we were still at um, um, Adam Road. Um, and, and, and when I received the call, um, you know, my wife was sobbing and crying. Really, really bad. And I couldn't make out her words. Because, you know, it's like, you know, when a person is so, uh, uh, so anxious, um, and, you know, I just couldn't make out her words. And, and, and I was really trying to, to listen to what she was saying. And, you know, uh, so, so I was like, um, and then my house was really jumping already. You know, it's like the heart rate was going up and up. And like, What's happening? What's happening? And then she told me that, hey, I need, to, I need you to meet me at, 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 the, at the hospital. I said, <laughs> even worse right now, right? I don't even know the context. And now you're telling me I need to go to the hospital. And so what happened was that uh, my, my little boy, when he was still a little baby, what happened was that, you know, he, he was at an age of six, seven months where he was flipping over, or even younger. When he was flipping, he was able to flip over. What happened was that, you know, you know, you know maybe nowadays we don't have, but, you know, in uh, olden times like my time, you know, we have powder in a little 
uh, bowl, a powder bowl, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you know. Uh, I'm not sure whether you all use it nowadays. And so what happened was, unfortunately, the cover was, uh, the, the, the cover and as well as the, as the, as the whatever you call it, the, 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 you know, the device to, 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 to put the powder on, on the baby, it, it came out. And unfortunately, the, the powder was exposed in the bowl. And my son flipped over and his whole head went into the bowl. My helper discovered him only, I don't know how for how long, but only discovered what happened when she went into the room to check on him. And by the time that she flipped him back, he was already blue in the face. So my wife, went, so my wife got home earlier than me, and so she told, that's why she told me to meet, meet uh, at the hospital. And, uh, she, and, and again, of course, she was crying. Uh, and by, the, by, the, by the grace of God, uh, you know, she, she, got, she got him. And uh, she just went downstairs and just, and just flagged down any, any, any car drivers who were just passing by. And by the grace of God, there was one, there was one driver that was, that was willing to just fetch her to, to, the airport, uh, to, to the hospital. So, of course, I reached the hospital and I saw my little baby boy. And uh, it was really blue. Uh, <laughs> uh, and never seen. Uh, and, of course, my wife was crying. And, you know, my heart was just... Uh, you know, there was just a really, really a storm that was just raging inside. And there were two things that, 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 was, that I was thinking about. You know, firstly, is that he could, have, he, he could die. And that was really traumatic. And the second thing that I was thinking about is, what if there was a permanent damage, uh, you know, inflicted by that, that lack of air? And, you know, would we be, would we, you know how would be our financial situation be, uh, you know, if there would be a permanent damage? And so there were so many things that was happening. But on the way to the hospital, I told God, you know, Kyla's, Kyla's life is in your hands. And then no matter what, you will take care of him. And so, he, so Kyla was, was, uh, was seen by the, by the specialists. Uh, they did some, they did some uh, extraction of whatever they could out of his lungs uh, and, uh, and also his stomach. And we saw powder uh, mixed with, of course, some other kind of uh, bodily juices. And, and, so, uh, and the doctor told us that likely he would be fine but they need to observe him over, over a couple of days. But by the grace of God, he, was, you know, he recovered entirely from it. There was no damage. You know, and now he's a healthy 16-year-old boy. Um, pretty handsome as well. <laughs> <laughs> but as I look back you know, on this situation again, I've always held on to one fact, that God is my anchor. God is always my anchor. And I can anchor my life on Him because He is the I Am. The I am that has proven himself throughout the history of the Bible, throughout the history of mankind, he says that I am. And as long as I recognize that he is a law of the storm, he can defy the laws of nature, then who am I to question that he is not able to? Amen? The second area, the second point that we, that we can thrive in a storm is to walk in Christ-centered faith. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 28, to verse 33. This is what Peter said to Jesus when he, saw, when he saw Jesus from afar. Verse 28, Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Verse 29, Jesus replied, come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid and, be and, be and beginning to sing, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when he climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. You know, turning our focus right now to Peter, let's look again at verse 28, because this is a very powerful statement that Peter said. Peter said to Jesus in verse 28, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. You know, the English translation has again uh, really the intensity of this statement. You know, when someone, someone says to you, uh, when you say to someone, tell me, it's like, okay, la, tell me, you know, tell me what you have for lunch. Um, tell me what you had for, for breakfast. I had, uh, I had tea with Winston this morning. <laughs> you know? And it's just tell me, law, you know, so what? Tell me, okay? Just tell me. But in the Greek word, tell me has a stronger revelation of what Peter is really saying. 
You see, the word tell in the Greek Bible is the word kaluson. Kaluson, and, and the word kaluson actually means command. So it's not just to, hey, tell me, lah, tell me what you have for breakfast, have what you have for dinner, but command me to do something. Command me, you know, to go there. Command me to obey. Command me uh, to, you know, to get your work done. You know, command me, you know, to get, you know, your proposal at 5 p.m. Okay, of, of course, I am stretching a little bit. But this is the intensity of the word kaluson. It is command. And so, in essence, Peter was saying to Jesus, if you really say who you are, the, the present called I am, then command me. Because you say you are, I am, then command me as the king of the world, as the, as the, as, as the God of creation to come to you on the water. Command me to come to you on the water. You know, there's something very important for us to learn from Peter here. You see, when we truly, rec- truly recognize the Lord of the storm, and when we begin to respond to that and place our faith in Jesus, we can live a victorious life. But there is a need for us to respond in faith. It's not just simply understanding and recognizing, but we need to respond in faith. You see, I want you to begin to observe this verse 28 again. It's a very powerful, it's a very powerful statement. In verse 28, this is what Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. You know, for, for many of us, and in the past, I thought that it was Jesus who told Peter to come to him on the water, in that it was Jesus who commanded Peter to come to, 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 come to him on the water. Isn't that true? You know, in the past, I always thought that, you know, it was, it was Jesus who said that to, uh, to Peter. But if you read this text carefully, it was Peter who initiated. It was Peter who said to Jesus himself, hey, if it is you, tell me to come to you. You see, this is a response of faith that's required when we go through the storms of life. We need to respond in faith. This is faith really in action. It's as visible as it gets. And there are two lessons on faith that we can learn from this account. Number one, faith requires us to act. You see, Peter acted on his faith. When he heard that Jesus says that, I, that he is I am, he acted out in faith. He stepped out of the boat. And this act was probably the most insensible that anyone could do. The most foolish action that could ever be done, you know, to step out of the boat. You know, the boat, you know, this boat represents some kind of safety. You know, this boat represents some form of a, you know, at least, uh, um, you know, I still have some hope to survive like, if I stay in the boat. But he acted out in faith. He saw Jesus for who he was. And he stepped out of the boat. He acted out his faith. You can't be any more visible other than that. See, I believe that the life in God, our lives in God is meant to be exciting. It's meant to be fun. It's meant to truly live our lives in the way that He wants us to live. It is abundant. And that is the life that God wants us to have. It is an adventure that God is, God is inviting for us to have. And when we begin to follow Peter's footstep, to say, Jesus, if it is you, call me to come to you, and you step off the boat, you will begin to see the miracles of God come to pass in your life. And many of us are reserved. Many of us are afraid of stepping off the boat. And that is why we don't see the breakthroughs that we want. And sometimes it just requires for us to act out our faith in a very practical sense. The second lesson of faith is to be Christ-centered. You see, Peter started walking on the water really well. Oh, wow, success, man. Wow, step out of the water. Hey, I could, I could walk pretty well, you know? And then he walked. He continued. But a moment, his eyes, his attention shifted away from the person of Jesus. And he started to look at the waters below. He started to sink. To sink. You see, our faith must be Christ-centered. You know, there is sometimes the, the lure of our faith to be very much uh, uh, us-centered. You know, there is a possibility that we want to have faith because we want to look good. We want to, you know, we want to know that, you know, God is with me. So, you know, I, and then we act out our faith, but 
our faith is very much not Christ-centered, but us-centered. And this is a lesson for us to learn that when we walk the walk of faith, our vision must be totally Christ-centered. You see, we must not direct our attention to our problems and to our needs. Of course, they are real. They are very real. But when we begin to focus our attention fully upon our problems and our pain, then what happens is that our thoughts, our time, will be centered on those things and we're not able even to have time to even go to God in prayer. We're not able to read the Bible and see what God's promises are. You see, fixing our eyes on Jesus is about really declaring that God is with you. And we need to follow Peter in his initial phase of walking on water to fix his eyes entirely and squarely on Jesus. You see, the fact, of, the fact is that storms of life will pass, whether we believe it or not. You know, sometimes in a storm, we cannot see you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, but the storms will pass. But the promise is that Christ will never pass away. You know, the Bible tells us that He is the northern star that will never change. You see, who you choose to be with and whom you choose to believe really starts today. Who you choose to be and whom you choose to believe starts today. The life in God is an attitude. The life in God is an attitude. And it's not dictated by external circumstances. It's not dictated by external factors. The attitude of life is dictated by the Word of God. Whom you choose to believe. Whom you choose to be with. You know, when was the last time that each of us came to Jesus in a prolonged time of prayer? You know, this Lent season, you know, Lent, Lent is, about, is, is basically 40 days leading up to Easter. And I've embarked on a time, really, of praying. Embarked on a prolonged time of praying and spending time with Jesus. Because I know that in order for me to be able to continue to serve Him and to be able to weather the storms of life, I need to spend quality, quality time with Him. You know, let us steadfastly read God's Word. Memorize it. See His Word for what it is. Dive into the Word. Take time. Spend time with the Holy Spirit. Allow Him to speak to you. Allow Him to speak through different church leaders. So you will be surprised at, at the fact that God is wanting to talk to you. Amen? How can we thrive in the storm? By firstly, truly recognizing the Lord, that recognizing that the Lord is the Lord of the storm. And secondly, to really have a Christ-centered faith. And the third area that we can thrive in storms is to look beyond to the other side. To look beyond to the other side. Matthew chapter 14, verse 34 to 36, and this is what it says. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of the place recognized Jesus, see the word here, recognize Jesus? They sent words to all the surrounding country. People brought some or all. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak and all who touched it were healed when they had crossed over. If you refer to verse 22 in, uh, in Matthew chapter 14, it says exactly the same thing. It says immediately, Jesus, he, uh, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. To the other side. You know, in this narrative, you know, oftentimes we can be so caught up with the miracle. You know, isn't that true? We can be so caught up with the fact that, wow, Peter walked on water. Only the second man on earth to ever be able to defy the laws of nature and to walk on water. And we are so caught up with the miracle. But yet, we forget one of the most important points in this narrative. And that is to go to the other side. To go to the other side. Go to the other side for what? For what? And we have just read that the reason that 
they are, the objective of them going to the other side of the lake was to heal the sick. And people brought not just some, but they brought all their sick just to let the sick touch the edge of his cloak. Just the edge. It's just like this one. The edge of his cloak. And they will be healed. And that, such was their faith in that this man who says that he is I am is able to heal them by just touching the edge of his cloak. And that was the very reason that Jesus wanted to go to the other side. In Mark chapter 1, verse 38, Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. That is why I have come. Let's go somewhere else, to the neighboring, uh, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. You see, Jesus was resolute about his mission on earth. You know, he wasn't caught up with the fact that he just fed the multitudes of people. He wasn't caught up with the fact that he just walked on water. He wasn't caught up with the fact that he just enabled Peter to walk on water. But he was resolute in his mind that he was to cross to the other side so that he will be able to preach the good news and to heal the sick. You see, desiring great faith and anointing without being missional is just spiritual consumerism. Let me read that again. Desiring great faith and anointing without being missional, is just spiritual consumerism. You see, water only flows when the tap is open. And my challenge to you is this, is your tap open? Is the resources that God has given to you flowing out of your lives into those who truly need them? You see, it is exactly the same with spiritual blessings. Unless our taps are flowing, the anointing will stop. Don't be caught up in spiritual consumerism. Don't be caught up with spiritual consumerism. But choose to bless others with, our, with your words, with your time, with your resources. When we choose to bless others and to meet the needs of people, their eyes can be opened to see the love of Jesus. You know, just before coming out, we had a conversation with uh, Pastor Sabrina and Pastor Andrew. I'm so glad, you know, to hear that many of you, you know, have pledged towards the missions rally, towards missions. I'm so glad to hear of the amount that you've contributed and also the percentage that has come in. This is what I mean by not being sucked in into spiritual consumerism, but to give for the purpose of missions where people be, will be able to see the love of Jesus. And I know that part of this money is, is going to the people of Ukraine. Without a heart of compassion for the lost, we can be very easily sidetracked. Very easily sorry, sorry. I've been a Christian for more than 30 years. And sometimes I can be so caught up with more anointing. You know, I used to be a full-time pastor for many years. You know, I can be so caught up with more anointing. You know, a bigger, bigger number of small groups under my care. You know, I can be so caught up with the fact that I, I want to teach better, I want to preach better. But my heart was not, for, was not missional. My heart was for self. Self-glory, self-gain. And I had, to, I had to come before God and God, forgive me. I pray this morning that God will put a mission of heart inside of you, despite the storms that you're going through. Because don't be caught up in our issues, the problems that you have. Because when we start to begin to see the bigger picture, begin to see what's on the other side, the end of the storm, we will begin to see that there is always a redemptive purpose behind what God is doing. You know, when I, when I was unable to be with you guys a couple of weeks ago, and I had COVID, and I asked God, what is your redemptive purpose, you know, in having COVID? Maybe I can travel, you know. But there's a truth in it, because of my desire for missions. Maybe, you know, uh, recovering from COVID is a plus factor when it comes to travel. But there's always a redemptive, fact, a redemptive purpose in the storms that God has allowed in your life. And what is that redemptive purpose? You have to find out. And, and for the disciples, their redemptive purpose is to be able to reach the other side and to be able to touch the lost, to heal all the sick, so that their eyes can be open to see that Jesus is truly the Son of God sent to them to heal their, to heal their diseases, 
you know, to heal their spiritual sickness. This should also become a priority of our lives, to be missional. I start off with, 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 the, um, uh, with the article by, uh, by, by, by Mr. Taman, and we are living in a decade that we do not know what is ahead of us. A very, very interesting decade that's in, fr in, uh, in front of us. Being in a finance line, you know, we, we, we read a lot of articles. We read a lot of, of articles and, and, and projecting ahead what's going to happen. We are living in a very difficult time. And for us to be able to weather the storms that may be coming, we need to remember that the Lord is always the Lord of the storm. He can defy nature. So what is the storm, right? And our right response should be just like Peter. Having a Christ-centered faith squarely on him. And lastly, having a missional purpose in our hearts. Don't be caught up with your pain. Don't be caught up. Don't be caught up in the troubles of life. There was a popular movement many, many years ago called WWJD. What would Jesus do? And my challenge for, for us is that what would Jesus do in your storms of life? In conclusion, I'd like to share with you this article that was penned by a Christian in China. Some say that he is a pastor. I don't know. No one knows. But it's, but it's entitled, Don't Waste This Epidemic. And so if the slides, you could help me with this one. Follow with me. He says this. This Christian wrote, or this pastor wrote, if you do not believe that the epidemic is allowed by God, you will waste this epidemic if you only rely on outside protection instead of seeking comfort from God, you will waste this epidemic. If you refuse to consider death, you will waste this epidemic. If you only want the epidemic to stop as soon as possible, but just to live a normal life without seeking to understand God's will and cherish Christ more, you will waste this epidemic. The next slide. If you spend so much time reading information with the, about a epidemic, but don't have enough time to, to read the Word of God, you will waste this epidemic. If you treat your sin as casually as before, you will waste this epidemic. If you do not make good use of this ep epidemic and make it an opportunity to witness to the true and glorious Christ, you are wasting this epidemic. And I'm going to apply this exact same message to the war in Ukraine. And, what, and before I go into that, can I ask the worship team to come up? If you spent, if, the next slide, the next one. If you do not believe that the war is allowed by God, you will waste this epidemic. If you only rely on outside protection instead of seeking comfort from God, you will waste this war. If you refuse to, com to consider death, you will waste this war. If you only want the war to stop as soon as possible, but just to live a normal life without seeking God's will and cherish Christ more, you will waste the war. And the last slide. If, if we spend too much time reading about the, the information about the war, but don't have enough time to read the Word of God, you will waste this war. If you treat your sin as casually as before, you will waste this war. And last lastly, if you do not make good use of this war and make it an opportunity to witness to the true and glorious Christ, you are wasting this war. You know, can I ask all of us to stand?